Um, and just to show that we are nurturing our own talent, because um, we were very excited by Talal's presentation before, his energy, his openness, we've got him working for you now. So he's going to be in a conversation with Ruth Fletcher from Karim, the VP of People, to talk about recruiting, retaining, and nurturing talent. Talal. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So today, you know, it's a pleasure to have Ruth here. She's running one of, or the most successful startup when it comes to HR. Um, massive, uh, um, uh, massive scaling across the board, revenue obviously, but team-wise as well. I've known Kareem since uh, they started, and it's pretty incredible. I think now you're over a thousand or two thousand. Yeah, we're um, we're three and a half thousand people now wow. across our network. Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. So maybe you know you can just give the audience a quick background about yourself and how you got uh, to Kareem. Yep, uh, no problem. Uh, so my name's Ruth. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to be here with you all today and hopefully sort of share some, some learning. Um, I've been in the sort of tech startup space for around the last 10 years. Um, sort of made the transition into um, a company called Namshi.com. Uh, it was the first rocket internet business uh, launched in the region. I joined them when they were four people, uh, so very small. They made an investment in people in HR very early on, uh, got the bug, uh, and since then, for the last 10 years, I've worked in a number of different startups at different stages, right from very inception to joining Kareem when they were about uh, 900 people, and then scaling that over the last almost two years to the three and a half thousand people that we are now across, I think we're in, in over a hundred different cities now um, and 14 different countries uh, in the MENA TP region. And I guess just so people kind of understand what it means to be head of HR at you know, a 3,000 person company, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about your role? Yep, so uh, my role covers everything from uh, working hand in hand with our commercial partners across the network um, and in uh, different cities within the region. So we do that through our people engagement partners who are on the ground. Um, I also take care of our centers of excellence. So they design things like our award strategies, um, our talent, learning, and culture strategies, and also take th care of things like our systems um, and our analytics. Um, and we also have a shared service center for HR that takes care of anything operational or administrative for, for the people in the network. And when you joined Cream, what was the most surprising thing you discovered? Um, I mean, Kareem was surprising on lots of different levels. I think, um, you know, from the outside, Kareem for me was a brand that I'd known for a very long time, um, seemed to be extremely successful, doing really well. Um, one of the most surprising things uh, when I arrived was just how chaotic um, it was internally, um, So, which was great. I mean, it, it represented a huge uh, challenge. But also, I think, um, if you speak to anyone who joins Kareem, either through the process of joining or when they actually join, one of the amazing, unique things about our organization is just how purpose-driven um, it is and how incredibly sort of humble and uh, mission-oriented our founders are um, and really how that permeates through our culture and everything that we do. Um, it's hugely surprising. There's no sort of retrofitting of a purpose to the organization. It's really sort of core to our DNA and who we are. And maybe transitioning to more about talent acquisition. Um, I think you've been at small companies and quite yeah. large companies, and I was reading that you know Larry Page, I think, still um, uh, approves every single hire made at Google. There are around 50,000 people now. Yeah. So what's the right level of involvement from the founders? Um, so I loved what Amir was saying earlier. He was basically saying, look, I suck at hiring, which I thought was super honest. And sometimes, you know, founders are not necessarily uh, the best decision makers when it, when it comes to people. Um, 
they should absolutely be involved in terms of sort of being clear about what it is uh, they're looking for in a hiring process. But I would definitely advocate getting others um, involved in that process uh, too. So being clear about what you're looking for, um, but uh, not necessarily being sort of having the buck stop with you uh, when it comes to hiring. If founders are going to be involved um, in a very practical way, they should be super aware of their own biases, right? Because we carry a lot of unconscious bias. So if you want a really diverse and inclusive culture, just making sure that you're not hiring people who kind of look and sound like you, being really aware that, that we carry that. Sometimes culture fit can sort of be a misnomer for people who look and sound like me. Um, but my advice would be uh, get more than one person involved in that decision-making uh, process and be really clear and structured about what you're looking for. Not just for today and what your company looks like today, um, but definitely for the future. Like be looking sort of six, 12 months in the future. What kind of skills, uh, what kind of aptitude and competency will be driving your business forward um, as you look and project forward? Forward, not just in the day to day. And you know, going back to what you said about sort of similarity bias, um, I think maybe that's one thing that's scary for a lot of companies in yeah. Dubai. That gives them the impression that you know, if I'm going into Saudi or Egypt, I'm not going to find talent because people there are quite different, right? So, what are the strategic differences you've observed, and and how you actually recruit in all these different markets? One of the things I absolutely love about working in this region is like how, how sort of idiosyncratic each of the markets are. Like they're so, so different when it comes to uh, the type of talent, the availability of talent, like the cost of talent, how complex it is to sort of uh, get people on board. So I think you do have to be quite personalized market to market. Um, so for example, um, in markets like Dubai, if you're looking to hire engineers, like typically speaking, there's a very small secondary market for engineers um, here, so you may need to be sort of creative looking abroad and how are you going to sort of structure your talent acquisition strategy uh, for that. Um, and, you know, other countries like Egypt, um, where you have a really, um, you have, uh, you know, lots of access to really available um, talent, you might look at things in a slightly different way there. So you do have to structure your talent acquisition strategy market to market. Market. But I would also say what's incredibly important for culture when you move beyond uh, being located in just one place is creating consistency through your talent acquisition process. So making sure that where you can, you're creating a lot of similarity in the context of the experience that the candidate is having. That's really important so that they feel like they're joining the same organization, even though it's located in multiple different places. Um, I guess going to the candidate experience, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of companies here, if you're applying for a job, it's really about you need a job, so, you know, we're just, you sell yourself to us. Mm. But how important is it for you to sell your company to every single candidate? It's, it's massively important. Um, so your candidates are your customers. Like it's as simple as that. You know, the, the, the crossover is undeniable. And I think research shows that something like 75% of candidates who have a bad experience with your organization wouldn't then use or purchase your service or your product. So getting that experience right is incredibly important, not just for your employer brand or your colleague brand, but your brand brand. And especially when you're in startup mode and maybe your product or your service you don't you know people don't have access to that more broadly um, this will be their one and only interaction with you and your brand so getting it right and making sure it stands for something is incredibly important and you know for people who are just looking to start building their HR team what are some of the strengths or core competencies they should look for in their first HR hire um, so I think flexibility, uh, adaptability, um, and depending on what the size of the organization is, sort of the willingness to get involved in multiple different things. So it may be that one day sort of you're dealing with highly operational issues on the ground. The next day you're having to be extremely strategic and sort of looking forward and mapping your talent strategy to your organization strategy. So the ability to, and I guess to pivot sort of really quickly is, is very important. And I think, you know, you've been doing this for, for over 10 years now. 
Um, so how has sort of technology or the emergence of platforms like LinkedIn changed the, the talent recruiting? When it comes to talent and recruiting, um, the automation of process and access to sort of license-based software has radically transformed the way people experience both sort of the candidate process, but also as a colleague uh, and an employee, their experience of um, HR process or the organization at large as well. So what it's meant is that individuals can um, get access to information very, very quickly, um, and they can have sort of very high touch experience as they move through different processes or parts of their life cycle with you in an organization. So through automation, we've definitely been able to drive much stronger, much quicker, much more human, actually, um, experiences with individuals who are either working within your company or they're applying for a role within your company. And, you know, moving to onboarding, which I think uh, takes a lot of experience to understand that onboarding is a very critical function yeah. once you've actually hired the right candidate. Um, I guess in your experience, what are some of the, you know, common onboarding mistakes that you see startups make? Um, well, even at Kareem, we've made so many onboarding mistakes, and I think the biggest mistake uh, people make with onboarding is not to take it seriously. Um, and one of the things we did in the early days at, at Kareem with onboarding is as we scaled, we removed the founders from the onboarding process. Um, and that was a huge mistake. So the ability for individuals coming into the organization to hear them speak about our purpose, our mission, our vision, um, their expectations is critical. Um, and yeah, that was a mistake that we rectified uh, very recently. I think as well, like this idea of putting experience at the heart of onboarding, like don't just throw tons of information um, at people and hope that they're gonna get excited about digesting it. Um, the likelihood is that they won't. Um, so make it an experience. At Kareem, we fly everybody into Dubai um, and they come for a three day onboarding program. And that way that we know wherever they are in the network, Work, they're having exactly the same experience. And we really push things like values and culture, not just through presentations and talks, but through the way they experience the onboarding. Uh, they spend a day in the customer care center. They spend an afternoon having tea with our captains. They lunch together every day. Lunch is really important to us. We make sure that they create relationships, they create networks. Um, so you can really sort of um, engage people in living your culture, living your values values right from the get-go. Um, so don't underestimate it. And I think it took us a while at Kareem uh, to sort of really hear what people were saying to us about onboarding. But the transformation that's occurred in terms of sort of early day churn and levels of engagement since we've, uh, we've switched to this very immersive onboarding program uh, has been really profound. Um, no, actually, that's you know a great point for all the the founders because after 150 uh, hires, I stopped doing a lot of the interviews, and mm -hmm. I realized that by not participating in onboarding, I didn't actually have a chance to meet these yeah. people. They right? don't hear so, your message. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, and you know, a lot of the time, if you ask people, you know, why did you join Kareem or why did you join anywhere? A lot of the time they've joined because of you. So it's either because of you as an individual or it's because of your vision or your purpose. Um, so they want to feel connected to you and they, they need to hear that, that messaging. And it, it's so engaging. And I guess, how do you measure, right? How do you measure a successful onboarding experience? Well, for us, we are obsessed with data. And I think this is something that you can be all over um, at any size of, of organization. And there's some amazing technology on the market now. You don't even need the technology. You can use sort of Google Sheets, spreadsheets, whatever it is that you need to do, Google Forms. But we survey people all the time. So um, we use an app, but we ask people um, every day in their onboarding, like which sessions have they enjoyed the most? What have they learned? Um, and then through sort of push notifications, we ask them to share feedback over different points in the life cycle up to six months when they've been with Kareem six months. So we're constantly monitoring their levels of engagement and how happy uh, they are with the experience. And then when we look at our churn as well, we segment it by tenure. So we can look and see, okay, are we, um, are we at risk? Um, are people not enjoying their first kind of three to six months within the organization? And I guess moving to talent development and retention, mm. um, one thing I experienced is, you know, I have a weekly meeting with HR and I found that I was spending most of my time talking about the low performers in the company, right? right? So 
how much, how do you balance spending your time as the HR team or as a manager focusing on helping the low performers get better versus the stars improve? I think um, if you look at where your two biggest opportunities lie in your employee population to drive performance, it's your uh, top performers and your low performers, and attention should be equitably distributed. However, we actually fell into the same trap at, at Kareem, and what we found was that engagement levels in our underperforming population were much higher than the rest of the organization, which is kind of not where we wanted to be. Like it suggested that all of our time and energy was going into uh, nurturing that talent pool, and we needed to redistribute it quite quickly. So just be aware of how people are feeling in the organization and how they're responding to those efforts. So we genuinely uh, believe that people can grow and can learn and should be given the opportunity to grow and learn. We believe in agile performance management and in essence what that means is like have one-to-ones with people every month, touch base, uh, you know, set expectations, talk about performance um, in a very structured way. Give underperformers the chance to improve um, but then act swiftly if you don't see the individuals sort of having the will uh, to transform their performance performance. Um, and we are very, very active in our top performer population as well. So we believe at Kareem that we reward performance with opportunities. So what that basically translates to is learning and development opportunities, access opportunities, exciting project opportunities, mobility opportunities. And this is how we really reward and engage our top performers. And we just recognize them. like We know who they are in the organization. And you know everyone here knows the motto: uh, hire slow, fire fast. Yeah. Um, and since this is you know a tech conference, it seems like a lot of founders have a different set of rules for engineers versus the rest of the organization. Um, can you tell us about your experience with that? In the firing context. Yeah, I mean, you know, we always thought having a low performing. So in sales, if someone's low performing, pretty easy to measure, and mm. you know, you let them go fairly quickly. But we always thought, you know, it's better to have um, a An low engineer. performing engineer and yeah. someone sitting there versus nobody at all. Listen, I think if it, in engineering and um, if you do look at companies like, um, you know, Google and, and the kind of whole concept of 10x in the context of engineers, you know, a high performing engineer will significantly, you know, they will deliver exponentially more value um, than a mid to low performing um, engineer. Here's what I do know uh, and I have observed. If you keep low-performing individuals within your organization, sort of regardless of the team, the impact on morale is significant. You know, what is your motivation to go the extra mile if people see that low performance is not being managed effectively? So I think it's really important to be structured um, and to be structured in terms of how you manage performance, clear about expectations, um, but also to manage low performance kindly. And you see that a lot. People are confused about how to deal with it. Um, you can have some amazingly positive um, and um, sort of fruitful conversations with people who are not performing in terms of supporting them to find their next opportunity outside of your organization. And actually, Patty McCord talks a lot about this in terms of managing performance at Netflix. Um, you can create a really strong alumni network. It doesn't need to be the end of the road with your organization kind of full stop, but you do need to manage performance. And I know that you know you started working on a lot of wellness and people that initiatives. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yep. Yeah. So um, wellness at Kareem basically means engagement, um, and I am a big fan of tracking engagement levels within an organisation. And again, sort of some amazing apps um, out there to to do this for um, any size of organisation. But it can as well just be a simple survey monkey or, or whatever it is. Um, but we track how people feel about everything at Kareem every single month. Um, and in that context, we also talk about things like well-being. So uh, workload, stress levels, how do I feel about my peers? How do I feel about uh, management? And then we use that as a platform for um, a lot of our people initiatives at Kareem. So if we see that 
people are feeling disengaged because of work overload, we'll go in and say, okay, how clear are we being with them about roles and responsibilities and goals and everything else? Um, and then we'll look at environment. So, you know, how conducive is environment, uh, environment to sort of uh, mental health um, and well-being? Um, we have a lot of inclusion initiatives um, for things like mums who are returning um, after being out, so returning to work, things like mums' rooms, flexible working. You know, we're huge on flexible working, making sure that people feel empowered to work when and where they want to, so being very results-focused. Um, uh, and uh, unlimited vacation, so we've just launched that. I know sort of in tech circles, it's sort of, it can be a bit divisive, but we're finding that it works really well. So for us, well-being is really about empowering people um, in terms of the, how they work. Um, that's, that's really important to us. And you know, last question before we go to Q&A, just because most of us are not from sort of an HR background. Mm. When you say employee engagement or engaged employees, what mm. does that mean exactly? Good question. So we ask everyone at Kareem once a month, how likely are you, rec uh, how likely are you to recommend working at Kareem to a friend? And it's a net promoter. It, it gives you a net promoter score. Um, and then we use that as an indicator of how engaged people are. And then we look at multiple different drivers that might be impacting that number. And then what we can do is we can segment it across pretty much um, any cohort, male, female, location, tenure, performance level, to really understand um, you know, where are our sweet spots um, and where do we need to action in terms of engagement. And again, we're so lucky. Like Our founders are super engaged. It's an organizational metric. Founders are held account accountable for it. Uh, team leads are held accountable for it. Um, and it sits at a company level. Um, organizational health objective as well. So it's taken extremely seriously at Kareem, which is great. Yeah. Great. Maybe we can uh, open up some questions from the audience. Um, so how do you guys think about uh, remote work? I know especially on the tech side, mm -hmm. um, remote working is an increasingly popular perk to have. How do you nurture talent when they're remote working maybe once a week, uh, sorry, one, one week a month or more? And how do you think about that at Kareem as well? Do you allow that? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got quite a dispersed engineering base anyway. So our engineering team sit in Berlin, and they sit in Pakistan, and they sit in Dubai. So the team actually is very well set up to manage two objectives. Um, and the overall tech team, which includes our product and engineering teams, work to these overarching objectives and key results. When you've got a strong management model and a strong management system, it actually really enables remote working. So if you're clear about what you need outputs to be, and you have a regular cadence of how people catch up, it really empowers people to work with freedom. And then it doesn't kind of matter. So as long as you've got the technology set up that enables you to work remotely, um, then we're, we're super happy happy for, for people to do that. Um, we are a very trust-based organization, and I get that that can be quite scary sometimes. Um, and especially when you're running really quickly, um, you know, you've got immediate deliverables, that like you're under lots of pressure. The temptation can be to have everyone where you can see them um, and you can manage them. Um, but what we know is that actually when you give people more autonomy over the output of, of their work, um, they tend to be much more productive. And, and that's what we have witnessed. And even actually in our care organization, so typically when you look at things like customer care, people will say, um, OK, well, we can't do unlimited vacation. We can't do remote working. We're now facilitating that even in things like our care organization. And what we're doing is small pilots with people who are sort of top performers in those parts of the organization. So almost like a reward piece, we're piloting it in those areas and seeing, OK, if it works, we extend it then to the broader, uh, to the broader community. It's a leap of faith. Um, if you're nervous, pilot it, sort of work it in smaller teams, see what the response is. Um, but my hypothesis is the more that you trust, and if you have strong systems to measure output, you will actually find people are more productive, and they're definitely more engaged with you as an employer. They will be so grateful for the flexibility and the freedom that you have provided them. So super quick one. Uh, my name's Alan Taylor. I work with a global organization called Endeavor. Uh, I have, I guess, two very quick questions. One is uh, when working with those star performers, right, sort of the top folks that you have, what are the frameworks you use 
for mapping their own journey in mm -hmm. the organization. And I guess I'm specifically interested in how far do you map out? Right? Do you think about the next six, 12, 18 months with them, or do you try to think further into the future? And then the second question, which is very short, is just you mentioned a couple times specific apps or tools that are useful. I'd love to know which ones Kareem yep. actually uses. For sure, we can share that. Um, so it's a great question on the top performers. Uh, we have this program called Astronauts Liftoff. So um, yeah, and we have sort of a lot of strong language indicators at Kareem. So we call employees, colleagues, uh, we call our top performers astronauts. Um, and we have a program called Astronauts Liftoff. Um, and the focus typically is over a six, anywhere between a six and 12 month cycle. So whilst we are strong believers in agile performance management, so having these frequent catch ups every uh, month, we review performance formally every six months. So that tends to be the cadence of performance review and then also development planning um, over a particular cycle. Anything longer for a fast moving organization, just keep the, it like nothing stays relevant. Um, anything less than six months, you're kind of struggling to make some traction. Um, and what we do is, uh, through the talent learning and culture team, they'll work with managers um, to sit with those individuals and say, okay, where do you want to be? Um, you know, what do you see in your future? And how can we help you get there? Whether that through, be through sort of different types of projects or access to digital learning platforms or conferences or um, whatever it might be. And then they'll have an individualized development plan that's kind of tailored to them. Um, and the second question on um, apps and uh, platforms, I've used some really great ones um, and um, we actually, for an HRMS at, uh, at Kareem, we use Oracle, um, so I won't talk about that a lot, um, but we use that as a single source of truth for our data. And then some of the other apps we use are Pecon, which is our engagement app, and we're actually just piloting another app called Culture Amp. Pecon has been incredible for our organization. We get over 75% engagement with that application every single month, which across a network of 3,500 people is nothing short of amazing. Um, it gives you, as an organization, like a ton of quant and qual data about how engaged people are in your organization, and it will benchmark you against uh, organizations out in the wider market, the global market as well. We use an app called Zugata. These are mostly Silicon Valley or, or London-based applications but that we have worked with um, to sort of customize for, uh, for a regional user base as well. Um, Zugata we use for performance and feedback. Uh, great for small to medium-sized businesses. We will probably upgrade that as we continue to grow, but it's been amazing for creating a culture of continuous feedback. Um, it also integrates, all of these apps tend to integrate with things like the G Suite, so you can integrate a lot of your applications. We use something called N-Border for our onboarding. I would highly recommend N-Border as extremely cost-effective and nimble um, and highly customizable as well, using push notifications and technology to drive experience through your onboarding. Right from the moment that you engage somebody in an offer all the way through to their first six months in the organization. Uh, and we're really enjoying using that application. We use Greenhouse for applicant tracking, so we've just recently switched from Jobvite to Greenhouse, which has, in my opinion, a far superior user experience um, and a much uh, stronger reporting mechanism. If you're going to invest in one application as a startup, I would highly recommend an applicant tracking system. Uh, so much value in that data and so much value in creating a seamless candidate experience through technology um, and through a good application. Um, there are a whole bundle of really uh, good HRMS uh, platforms, cloud-based platforms that you can secure on a user-by-user -user basis um, uh, for managing your core HR data. People HR is one that I've used uh, previously, um, and I used that at namshi.com, and I also used that in London uh, with the Lovecraft startup. Both of those organizations grew from about six or seven people to three to 400 people, so it will scale with you um, over that sort of volume. 
of headcount. But if you're looking uh, for advice and guidance on what technology to use in HR, um, then you should definitely read anything that Josh Burson has to say. Uh, Josh Burson sort of Delo at, at Deloitte. Um, he is one of my HR heroes. Um, and whenever I'm looking to sort of secure technology, I'll read up what he thinks um, and what he's got to say about it. Um, and um, also Laszlo Bock, who's the ex-head of people operations at Google and now runs a company called Humu, which is all about people analytics and people. Um, again, like he's a great reference point. Um, so just do your due diligence and, uh, and take a look and make sure the biggest mistake you can make is buying something that works for you right now. Like really project into the future, six to 12 months down the line, and think about what you're going to need then. Because when you're scaling quickly, um, these applications are not fit for purpose for very long. OK, uh, this is Mohammed, uh, co-founder and CTO of Classera uh, in EdTech. Uh, and uh, thanks for the great uh, discussion. Uh, it has been a great interview. And now uh, I have a brief question about um, sometimes we have internal discussions. And we, we have it actually regularly in our management meetings about uh, to keep people performing in a better way. Should we introduce more strict rules on punishing the, uh, the people who are not working as good as we, uh, we want? or? Uh, adding more into the in, uh, incentives for the great people. And this is uh, always uh, an internal fight, uh, let's uh. say, in our board that uh, uh, f some of uh, the, uh, the board members, they say, in case you, you see someone who would work or improve his performance because he is afraid of the punishment at the end of the month or after three months' uh, assessment, uh, then this, this guy shouldn't be there in the team anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if someone is working uh, uh, just for the incentive, again, this is not the right member to be in the team that he is working just to get the incentive. Yeah. So uh, what do you see the right formula, the right balance between uh, making, um, let's say, uh, a balanced uh, um, uh, formula for making everyone working uh, on track, um, uh, maybe balancing between the vision and believing in the com company values, in addition to, again, still keeping that OK, we will not let someone with a low performance in, or we will not treat all people the same, mm. the one with low performance and the one with uh, great performance. So if you can, based on your experience, yeah, get, yeah. give some suggestions, or uh, uh, in, maybe in Kareem, uh, what kind of, uh, um, I don't want to say punishment, but uh, <laughs> what kind of uh, yeah, rules you have to make sure that everyone is, is working on track. OK. Um, good, like, uh, definitely sort of multifaceted uh, question there. Um, I definitely we don't believe in sort of punishment. I think sort of performance is not driven by fear. So we know that uh, sort of building a high performance culture can definitely be synonymous with uh, being Kareem um, and sort of being kind to people. And I think the challenge that you need to create for yourself is to put pressure on yourself as an organization to say, have I set really clear goals uh, for the individuals within my organization? So number one, have I held my talent acquisition bar really, really high? It's so tempting when we're moving so fast and we're building at scale to sort of rush people through the door. So, um, you know, what Talal was saying um, earlier, you know, hire really slowly and then make performance-based decisions really quickly. Um, do not make performance-based decisions on your gut. Like, have a system in place, even if it's just, you know, you're aware of where you're going over a quarter or you're aware of where you're going over six months and make it really clear to individuals, okay, how does what I do connect to that. So you create a path for them with some clear goals and setting clear expectations. That makes managing performance really easy um, because then they're very objective conversations. Um, and then we also have a values-based component, right? So total performance to us is delivery against objectives and how are you doing? Um, and then it's how are you living our values? And we have sort of a quite structured set of questions that will enable us to sort of um, understand that. We are also very 360. So we don't assess performance based on what a manager perceives performance 
needs to be. Um, if you are somebody within the organization, we get full 360 performance feedback. So uh, what do my peers think? Um, what do people in my team think? What do my internal customers think? So like a full 360 approach. Um, but we are all about setting goals and setting sort of big um, ambitious goals and then really saying to people through servant leadership, right, we're big believers in servant leadership, we hold our leaders to the highest bar. Um, what can I do as a leader to, um, to create the space for you to achieve those objectives? And then I think with good conscience, you can have very powerful performance. Uh, you can have very powerful performance conversations. We also don't believe in short-term incentives, so we reward performance with opportunities. We've gone down that road, by the way. We have offered short-term incentives and bonuses, but we find that they don't drive superior performance. Thank you very much for your time. You're I think welcome. it's lunchtime, so uh, that's it for now. First, uh, this is Maham Elhem from uh, Visita. <laughs> yeah, very quick one. So thank you very much for the very insightful discussion. I just want to build on the question asked by Endeavor about the engagement. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned that you do the process monthly yeah. and you gather a lot of feedback. So I just wanted to know how do you prioritize what you get as feedback and how often you change things given in startups we have resource crunch usually when it comes to uh, people allocated to change. Um, so we, every month when we track, we track across different engagement drivers. So we'll see things are peaking um, or not. So as an example, over the last six months, we've focused on management support. So how supported do I feel by my manager? Am I having regular one-to-ones? Does my manager live the values? And we've run a whole sort of suite of um, projects around that. And as that's increased, so real, like the increase has been from in the single digits to an MPS of kind of over over 45, we've seen it's had a direct impact on the overall levels of engagement in the organization. But the data set is so powerful, you can easily identify manager by manager, team by team, where your red flags are in terms of your engagement drivers. So it's very data driven, um, it's not anecdotal. But then if we see, okay, through the data, there's a red flag, we can then dig into the qualitative stuff and say, okay, what are people actually saying? And then as well, if we see red flags, it's not just about the data, we go in and we run focus groups and we say okay we're just checking here uh, what's going on um, and we'll run a more detailed focus group and out of that we'll have action points but the amazing thing about these applications it puts engagement in the hands of individual managers it's no longer like an HR process where we come in and sort of say right we're going to fix your engagement we can't do that so look for technology and applications that give access to information to managers the people team can then support you and facilitate you to make the right decisions, but fundamentally it sits with the individual manager. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Talal.